Welcome back. I'm Shane, this is Relative Time, and today I finally get to answer yes to a question I've been asked ever since I started the channel. You see, early on I learned that watch geeks and watch enthusiasts are obsessed with true GMTs. Because almost every time I showed a GMT, like say this Christopher Ward, there'd be somebody asking if it was a true GMT. And until now, the answer's always been no, just because outside the luxury watch game, there are very few true GMTs. Well, today that changes, and we're going to be talking about a true GMT with the brand new Strato Timer by Jack Mason, which is potentially one of the most important releases of the year, as it's one of the very first watches to utilize the brand new Miyota 9075 true GMT movement which will allow microbrands to create a true GMT at a reasonable price. And we'll talk a little bit more about value at the end. But even beyond the GMT side of things, Jack Mason's just made a killer watch here, and I'm actually excited to share it with all of you. Now, before we get into all of this, I do need to mention a few things. First off, this is a prototype that was lent into the channel. And as such, all your standard prototype warnings apply. Second, the promotional tag is up because Jack Mason mentioned that once production was complete, they'd send me one to keep. In third, Jack Mason is based out of the Dallas area, as am I. And they actually invited me to a reveal party that they had in town when they first got their prototypes. And because of that, I've actually gotten to know the brand and some of the people behind it a little bit, as well as a few of the other reviewers that also showed up to the reveal party. Now, that said, let's just jump into this one and start off with the specs. The Strato Timer is a 40mm wide watch without, and a 44.3mm wide watch with the crown. Also, note here that the bezel itself is 41mm, so it does stick out just a little bit, enough to get a decent grip, but not so much that it gets in the way. Lug to lug here is coming in right at 47mm, and as for total thickness, you're looking at a decent 132 which does include a double-domed box-cut sapphire crystal and a screwed-in exhibition case back. Although, if you don't count that crystal, the case thickness itself is only 11.25, giving it a fairly slim profile. Rounding everything out, you have a 20mm lug width, a weight around 150 grams on its bracelet, give or take a link or two, a sapphire-coated bezel, as well as it's all powered by that Miyota 9075 true GMT movement. It's also going to be fully assembled in the USA, I believe out of Ohio, which I think is the same facility that does LoomTech, although I could be wrong on that. And the movement itself is going to be further regulated here, just for better accuracy. According to their site, they're actually shooting for plus or minus five seconds a day. One thing to take notice of here with the specs is that this is basically what watch enthusiasts have been asking for recently. 40 millimeters wide with a shorter 47 millimeter lug to lug something not too thick, as well as something not too heavy. Basically, just finding that sweet spot in terms of comfort, mixed with a tool watch's aesthetics and utility. Jack Mason here has tried to create a watch that should fit a wide variety of wrist sizes, as well as one that really just marks off all those boxes of things people want. And a lot of that is just because behind the scenes, Jack Mason has been studying what watch enthusiasts really want, and they're trying to deliver it here. You see, Jack Mason has been around for a while now, and the guys behind it have been in the watch industry even longer. But most of that history has actually been more on the fashion watch side of things. Yet, the Strata Timer here is really part of their attempt to rebrand themselves and become more focused on the enthusiast market. The way they put it is that their goal is really to become the microbrand of Texas, which is one of the reasons they've shifted their logo from their name to this Lone Star that sits at the top of the watch just to represent that. The thing is, in a lot of ways, Jack Mason got really lucky when Miyota offered to give them some of their 9075 movements, as Miyota's being very selective about who's getting these. So the guys behind Jack Mason really see this as a huge opportunity, one to really make a name for themselves and establish a good reputation. They've stressed that they really want to be in this for the long haul, and they don't want to screw this up. So they're doing everything they can here to build an ideal GMT. But as usual, it's going to be all of you watching at home to decide whether or not they succeeded at that. For me, I think they've come pretty close to that, and especially when it comes to comfort. I've actually had this prototype for over a month now, and I've even taken it on a week-long trip to Arizona. It's one of those watches that just seems to blend into your wrist. 
one you can easily wear all day, and more importantly, I found it to be one that I didn't really want to take off. With the shorter lug to lug and its lower center of gravity, it sits perfectly and securely on the center of my 7.25 inch wrist. It's easy to read, easy to use, as well as being pretty easy on the eyes. But let's move on to the case itself here, which is 316L stainless. And I think the easiest way to really describe this case is that it's a bit mini turtle-ish. Where you have these curvy flowing sidewalls paired with these short stubby lugs. Looking straight down at the watch, you can see that the case itself is rather minimalistic. Brush top, no crown guards, and a very polished sidewall. Overall, it's well done with a good finish. And the lack of distraction here I think does help keep your focus on the bezel and dial. Although, I can see some people having an issue with this simplistic case design, at least for the price. And especially if you're comparing it to something like Christopher Ward and their light catcher cases. Yet, I do think it's rather fitting with the slight retro styling they're going for. And I think the case design itself does pair well with the box crystal. Personally, my concerns here are going to be more geared towards that large polished sidewall, and just how it's going to attract smudges as well as micro scratches over time. If Jack Mason hasn't already, they really should look into scratch resistant coatings, just to help keep this watch looking pristine longer. Now over at the right we have the sign screw down crown, which is complete with their Lone Star logo. The crown's a good size that's easy to unscrew and use. Flipping the watch over, you get a glimpse of the screwed in case back, where it says designed in Texas at the top and assembled in the USA at the bottom, as well as the four small screws which hold the case back in. And for some of you, it might seem odd that they just didn't go with the standard screw down case back, but doing it this way, they can guarantee that the case back is always upright. Underneath the crystal here, you also get a glimpse of the Miyoda 9075, which, just like the 9015, is a rather plain and boring looking movement. Although, they did say that the production units should have a custom rotor, and that should help this look a little bit better. Back to the front, we have the sapphire covered 24 hour GMT bezel. It's bi-directional, as a GMT bezel should be, with 48 clicks. Overall, it has a good action, but there is a little more wiggle room to it than I like. And not just back and forth, but also up, down, and left and right. Although Jack Mason did say that the bezel click tolerance will be tightened with the production units, and hopefully they can do that. Currently, there are only three colorways available at launch. And if I remember the names right, it's going to be the Americana, the Espresso, and the Candy Corn. Eventually there will be more, which does include a Lone Star version, as well as a Batman. But for now, for the very first batch, it's just going to be those three, and then they'll build up as they go on. This of course is the Americana colorway, which has a Pepsi colored bezel paired with a blue sunburst dial. Now, as I've said in the past, I'm not really a big Pepsi fan. But I think this is actually my favorite colorway after spending some time with it. I really like how the bezel colors are a bit more faded, giving it more of a subtle profile, yet still a bit of pop when you look at it. Giving it more of a faded flag look than, say, a can of soda. Let's start off at the outer edges and move in. The dial design here has a painted chapter ring right at that outer edge, which just happens to sit right at the edge of the box crystal. And because of that, it winds up giving that chapter ring more of a magnified appearance at various angles. Moving a little bit in, you come to the wider wedge applied indices, which have a brushed finish on top, creating a contrast with the reflective dial. Yet they also come down to this very polished edge as you head towards the center. And when you zoom back a little bit and take all those indices in at once, those polished edges really guide your eyes right to the center of the dial and helps orientate the watch's overall positioning, creating a design that looks great, yet is also very functional. The hands here are one part that I've gone back and forth on. The GMT and the second hand look great, but the hour hand and the minute hand, well, when I first saw them, I thought they might be a little bit too narrow. And because of that, maybe a little bit harder to see, at least compared to the indices. Yet, as I got the watch out into the real world, I noticed that the hand's unique design, with the polished sides and brush center, catches the light beautifully. And because of that, it was never a problem to find them. Although, that said, I still think this might look a little bit better if they were wider. And just in case you haven't noticed it, check out the counterweight on the second hand. It's a little red, white, and blue flag, for just a little bit more Texas flair. 
Then over at the right, you have a nicely framed date. I always prefer a date at the six as I think it helps maintain symmetry, but three o'clock is the more traditional position. And in this particular situation, it might look a little crowded if you move the date down to the six, just because there's a lot of text here. But moving back up towards the 12, we do see the Jack Mason logo, which has been simplified to a Lone Star for Texas, which I think was a genius move on their part. It's simple, clean, identifiable, and as someone who lives in Texas, it's something I can appreciate. With this watch, there are really only two things I'd caution you on. The first of which is this particular blue dial. Majority of the time, it's a good looking blue. But I have noticed that with this particular dial, if the light is too intense at specific angles, it can get washed out. And I think there's some shots here that have shown that. The other thing is that this design can look a bit crowded, especially with the box cut crystal. So those that want a simple, clean looking dial may want to look somewhere else. Although, to be fair, most GMTs do look a bit crowded. It's just kind of how they are. Although there are a few exceptions to that, but I do think they are exceptions. Earlier, I mentioned how some might be disappointed in the case, especially if you're comparing it to say a Christopher Ward light catcher case. But while the case may not be a light catcher case here, pretty much everything else is. And that's something I really love about this watch. From the Jubilee bracelet, the edge of the box cut crystal, the dial, everything here is catching and playing with the light in its own way as you move. And the designs of the indices and the hands with their dual brush polished textures are particularly eye catching, and I think that helps them really stand out when you want to read the watch. Now, this is a prototype, so I am excusing some of the specs on the dial. But other than that, overall, everything else looks extremely well made and I gotta say it looks pretty fitting for the price range. And while I have nitpicked a few things here or there, overall it's pretty great design. It's a little retro while still feeling modern. It's eye-catching, beautiful, and more importantly highly functional, all while maintaining the soul of a tool watch. In short, Jack Mason created a great, if not almost ideal GMT here, with a great balance between form and function. With that said, let's turn the lights down low and talk about Loom. And one important thing to note here is I'm specifically talking about this colorway. With the Americana, you get green C3 on the bezel and GMT hand, while everything else is a strong BGW9 blue, giving you a very strong and readable profile in the dark. The bezel fades out a little quickly, but that's one thing Jack Mason says they're addressing. As for the rest of the watch, in terms of longevity, it's good. If you pay attention to it compared to the Seiko Diver, you'll see that the minute and hour hand fade out just a little bit before that Seiko, whereas the second hand in the indices, they keep going on and on. And if you look at the surface area between the two on the watch, it's not much of a surprise. As I said before, the hands do look a little narrow here. So effectively, I'd say the loom is good, but personally, I'd like it if they could improve the hands just to stay up with the rest of the watch, just to keep things consistent. As for the movement, as I've said a few times already, you're looking at the new Miyota 9075 True GMT movement, which has the same 28,800 beats per hour and 42 hour power reserve as the rest of the 9000 series. But it takes all of that and combines it with a jumping hour hand. The jumping hour hand is controlled by advancing the crown to the first position and then rotating it forwards and backwards. And if you haven't figured it out already, there's no traditional quick set date here. In order to advance the date, you have to jump that hour hand past the 12 and then keep going and jump it past the 12 again. Which for some may be a little frustrating, but that's just the price you pay for a true GMT. Now, there is of course the debate on if a true GMT or a traveler's GMT is truly better than a caller's GMT, which honestly is a much longer conversation for another video. But I will say that personally, while I don't think a true GMT is truly superior, as after all, we humans are intelligent and adaptable creatures, so we can learn to use whatever at hand effectively. But after taking a short trip with a true GMT, I will say that it's more convenient when you're actually hopping time zones. So if you're actually traveling, then I would say it is the preferred movement. As for the bracelet, the bracelet is fantastic. 
It's actually one of my favorite parts about the watch, and I can't say enough good things about it. It's a Jubilee-style bracelet, but instead of the three polished links in the middle, you get five polished mini links, creating perhaps a Super Jubilee. Or maybe it's just a cross between a Jubilee and a Beads of Rice bracelet. But whatever it is, it looks great. And I love how those smaller center links catch the light as you move around. And as I mentioned before, this bracelet is extremely comfortable, a lot of which has to do to the tapering, going from 20 to 16 at the clasp. The bracelet has solid end links with quick release, solid links secured with screws, and while this prototype doesn't have it, the production units are going to ship with a great milled clasp that has an on-the-fly adjustment. They only had a few of those at the release party, but it was pretty impressive at just how thin it is and how well it worked. So just like the rest of the watch, the bracelet here hits all those check marks of what you'd want. And lastly, well, usually I like to close these things out by talking about value, but this one is particularly tricky as there are only two other watches out there that I know of that will be using this movement. The first one was the Dress GMT from Bulova, and this is the one that's only actually currently available. And the other is another pre-sale from Boulder for a Diver GMT. In comparison, the Jack Mason is the highest of the three, but not by much, as the Strato Timer is currently being offered at $999. The thing is, a year ago, if someone announced a new GMT at $999, no one would really bat an eye. After all, GMTs are typically expensive. However, this year things have started to change, and in large part due to the new Seiko GMT movement, as that new lower-priced NH34 GMT movement has been popping up in some pretty affordable watches. And after that, $999 seems to be a bit more than it was. But the thing to remember here is, is that this isn't a Seiko NH34 movement, nor is it one of the older Salida or Eta based GMTs. Rather, this is using the brand new Miyota 9075 True GMT movement. And a True GMT at this price, regardless of timing, is something to stand up and take notice of. Especially for everyone who's consistently been asking for one. I know you're out there, I've heard you. As before these 9075s, under a thousand dollar true GMT would have been unheard of. So the value argument here really comes down to whether or not you care about a true GMT. If you don't, there are plenty other options out there. But if you do, then this one is going to offer a ton of value. And as for the quality of the watch itself, I gotta say everything here seems pretty reasonable for what you're getting. So bottom line, Jack Mason may be a brand you've never heard of but I think it's one you're going to be hearing a lot about in the future. I think the highest praise I can ever give a watch is that this is one I'd spend my own money on. Now, if you were listening to me at the beginning, you'll have heard me say that Jack Mason's going to send me a production unit later on, so I don't have to. But if they hadn't have said that, I'd have one of these on pre-order right now. Every once in a while, I'll get a prototype to wear and completely fall in love with it, to the point that I don't really want to give it up. And the Strata Timer is one of those, and especially after actually traveling with it. There might be a few things I'd tweak, but overall I think it's pretty close to what I'd want out of a true GMT, and what I'd want out of a watch in general. It's a good looking watch, but not one that's over the top and begging for attention. It's functional, easy to use, durable, and extremely comfortable on the wrist. And when you're talking about a travel watch, size and comfort is paramount. And the strata timer here is ideal for me in those factors. Now, depending on where you're from, you may not care about this whole assembled in the USA thing or the Texas aspect of the brand. But for me, I gotta admit, I'm a sucker when it comes to Texas based stuff. So these are all huge pluses for me as well. But at the same time, I can understand if you don't feel the same way. Either way though, this is a great GMT and one I highly recommend. The only thing I'd really caution you on is that if you're not 100% sold on this design, then know that more true GMTs with this 9075 movement are coming. I don't think they're going to be released as fast as, say, the Seiko based GMTs, but eventually there will be more. And there may be one you'll like better. Only time will tell. Anyway, that's the Jack Mason Strato Timer in a nutshell. As usual, let me know what you think about it down below, as well as what are your thoughts on true GMTs in general. And as always, if you enjoyed the video, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. I'm Shane, this is Relative Time, and I'll see you next time.